All right. First rule of this channel, we do not talk about the channel. Second rule of this channel, this is not legal advice. So uh, I tried to do this yesterday. It kind of surprised me. I was tearing the rookies uh, in order to uh, redo the redraft rankings. And I realized that I had just basically tiered them um, for a dan from basically a dynasty perspective. Um, I tried to do the video yesterday and um, just wasn't feeling it. Um, I do want to get this out because I, I do want to talk about the rookies and their landing spots and the overlap between dynasty and redraft. Again, uh, from a redraft perspective, we want to know like how fast that guy can win me a league from a dynasty perspective. I want to know how fast that guy can win me a league. Um, dynasty is a little bit funky from the regard that um, it's about how long a guy will give me the window to win a league. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit because certain guys from a dynasty perspective, if we're just going to talk about dynasty, like, and I have the, the quarterback pulled up right now, um, getting in this tier of like 16 to say even like 18 points a game, maybe, maybe 18 points, uh, a little too, too high, but like 16, 15, 16, 17 points a game, those guys grow on trees. Uh, so even from a dynasty perspective, how I would go about attacking a guy like that the amount of capital that I would have to ship to an opponent, or even if the guy's available on waivers um, to, to pick him up on my, my roster is relatively easy. You know, I get, I probably, depending on your league settings, again, from a dynasty perspective, I don't know if you have like, you know, 20 roster spots, 30 roster spots, how many, how big your taxi taxi squad is, you know, like I, I like deeper benches um, because it takes the luck component out of fantasy football and it puts it into the skill component. Um, I had a guy in my main money league um, that we switched over from dynasty back from dynasty to regular because the the amount of effort like guys didn't like coming in every year going like hey we're gonna lose I, I'm just not invested and in my redraft league one of the guys was like I just wait for you to drop anybody and then I picked them up because I figure that you know something I don't so that's kind of the idea I don't know the the league settings for your dynasty leagues I don't know how deep you're gonna go because some of these guys are gonna be deeper stashes. Um, being able to look like two, three years down the line for that uh, potential legendary payoff, um, as opposed to you know, how many of these guys will grow on trees. And my perspective, wide receiver twos and wide receiver threes grow on trees. Running back twos, you know, those those guys could be a little tougher to find, but I can Frankenstein that position. Tight end, I can Frankenstein. Quarterback, I can stream. Like that's just kind of the idea behind it. So like I, those those high end wide receiver ones, those running back ones, those legendary quarterbacks. Um, again, legendary quarterbacks are more important than even like regular, like the, the 18, 17 point quarterbacks that we can look at because of those guys being able to be replaced by a guy off the waiver wire. And again, in your dynasty leagues, I don't, I don't know how your settings are going to be set up. I don't know. Uh, you know, you could carry a lot of quarterbacks in those dynasty leagues that in redraft leagues that you, you probably wouldn't, um, the, you know, the general meta for redraft leagues is do not carry more than one quarterback. You already know, uh, from my perspective, I think it's about the value of the position. I don't want um, league winners to be on my opponent's roster because the meta says don't carry two quarterbacks. So I said this last year, you know, I don't want Jordan Love to be um, on my opponent's roster in the fantasy championship because it's probably going to cost me a chip. You know, that's just the way I roll. If you're just like, hey, I'm not going to carry two quarterbacks, that's up to you also. But again, it depends on the value of the player. Uh, that 18 point is probably enough for me to go. I don't want that guy available um, on the other side of the coin. You know, I'm not going to probably carry a CJ Stroud into my chip. Um, you know, he's going to have limited value even in dynasty because you know the ability for him to get a legendary season is going to be a much rougher road. When we get into some of these guys, I'm going to tier uh, you know uh, the rookies into groups and explain why I would tier them into the groups that they're in. And again, I don't know if your redraft leagues are going to have like three three rounds, four rounds, you know, if you're going to be sneaky and try and get some of these guys after your, your rookie draft is over, because again, I probably would attack some of these guys from that perspective, uh, especially as camp goes on. Um, I'll, I will talk about a few of those guys that are be a little bit interesting because trying to parse out uh, where the guys that go outside of uh, round four um, in the, the regular NFL real life draft of round five and lower undrafted free agents, they're they're not don't have the best road to even make the roster fourth round picks and above mean that they're probably going to make the roster so that's just something to be paying attention to so let's uh get into it uh quarterbacks the top guy that i would have right now is jane daniels he's the one guy and and i'm talking with the exception of maybe uh marvin harrison jr i'm just looking at my notes 
Uh, Jaden Daniels may be the one guy who's in that unicorn type of league, that legendary type of tier because of that rushing upside. Now, I don't entirely love him as a prospect, but I don't care about that from a fantasy perspective. I care about being able to uh, hit this tier of rushing ab ability uh, that like your Josh Allen's, your Jalen Hurts, uh, your uh, Kyler Murray's, uh, Lamar Jackson's have. That's what he's going to be able to do to set him apart. Uh, that's why I would put him in uh, his own special tier. Marvin Harrison would be in the next tier of, of, of the different group. But I, as a quarterback, he would be the number one quarterback because of that rushing us. So I also like what the uh, Redskins did in the draft to set him up. He's got Scary Terry. He's got Dotson. Um, I did like Ben Sano. I think he's underrated. I don't think he he they overdrafted Sano um, with in, in the second round of the draft. I also like Brandon Coleman to come in help him out uh, on the offensive line. And then Luke McCaffrey, that's another one. Like he's, he is set up to not fail. This is this other thing I'll talk about uh, with the Patriots down the line. Um, and we'll also talk about with the Giants. Cause I didn't totally like what the Giants did, but I can understand their perspective, but that I would have Jaden Daniels and that, that the number one quarterback. And then the next two guys um, I would tear together. And that's Caleb Williams. Again, I don't know how much of the rushing upside he's going to have throughout his career and I can't even necessarily project that out uh, this year. So from a scoring perspective, you're probably looking at maybe like a DAC type season. You know, if if we can get the higher volume down the line and a little bit of nimbly bimbly, uh, you know, Jordan Love would be another one. Like I, I would expect that maybe the over underline is going to be around about Jordan, uh, Jordan Love with the 4,100 yards passing, 30 touchdowns. Uh, 240 yard, 47 yards rushing and two or four touchdowns, maybe. The, and that's still a little high as a rookie. That's that's a hard road to to hit because with CJ Stroud in those 15 games that he played, he did 4100 yards, 23 touchdowns uh, to go along with three rushing touchdowns. So that's as a rookie. And uh, Caleb Williams, if he doesn't hit those rushing ups, that, that rushing upside, he's going to tumble down those tiers. And and I've talked about this. Um, once you start getting into that, like Jared Goff, Brock Purdy tier, they become heavily replaceable, like on a week to week basis. You know, uh, I, I doubt that anybody's carrying your Baker Mays in your dynasty leagues and, and uh, in your redraft leagues, it's because like, you know, your Joe Burrows went down. So again, uh, it doesn't matter how good I think Caleb Williams is or how good you think Caleb Williams is how he can produce these legendary seasons from a, a fantasy perspective. It's a little bit tougher um, if he can't hit those higher volume passing totals and he doesn't uh, you know, run into the end zone. So to get you there. So the, the next guy um, and I would tier uh, Caleb Williams with Drake may. And again, I don't care about talent. Uh, Drake may, may be the second best rusher out of this group. Um, and I do really like what the uh, Patriots did in the draft. Like, I went from like they have a horrible receiving room to uh, uh, Jalen Polk going in the second, and then I really like Javon Baker. We'll get to Javon Baker later on, and then Caden Wallace. I think is potentially a good pickup, and Layden Robinson. Like they may have an offensive line, they may have some receivers. Um, that's all I really care about. And then uh, Jaheim Bell, they went and got in the seventh. He's going to potentially have what's necessary to uh, produce. So from a dynasty perspective he could end up having better rushing totals down the line than Caleb Williams. He's already going to start off with good, good receivers or theoretically good receivers because of the draft. So yeah, I, I would probably put him just below Caleb Williams. And again, maybe the reason why I would put Caleb Williams ahead of Drake may is because I do think Caleb Williams may be special in a way that Drake may is not. Um, and that's just like my tummy feeling. We all know what that means from a fantasy perspective. It doesn't matter. But uh, there, there may be higher rushing upside from Drake May than there would be Caleb Williams. That's why I would put them together in that sub-elite tier. Maybe we can get rushing upside from Caleb Williams. Probably going to get a little bit more from Drake May. Um, the next guy, I got to make sure I have this pulled up. Um, I would put, J J from a dynasty perspective, I would put J.J. McCarthy ahead of Bo Nix. And Bo Nix and J.J. McCarthy would be in the same tier. There is a possibility that uh, J.J. McCarthy doesn't even start this year and that would uh, obviously hurt him in redraft i talked about this in redraft he would be about quarterback 20 if he wins the job that's the same place i would have sam dartle uh higher volume passing offense very uh quarterback friendly um deceptive nimbly bimbly those are the things we all like and the only difference really between him and uh, bo nick bo nicks may be a little bit more 
have a little bit more rushing upside down the line. I don't think that's going to be part of the, the Sean Payton offense. Uh, I, I don't dislike him as a prospect. I think like he's fine, but from a fantasy perspective, just fine means that like, maybe I'm going to get Brock Pur- Purdy 17 points a game. That's not going to win me anything. Uh, again, this is a roster construction problem that uh, you would have. And I wouldn't um, when it comes to drafting these guys. Um, and then finally, there's two other guys I want to talk about uh, from a fantasy perspective. Michael Penix Jr., purely dynasty at this point, unless Kirk Cousins goes down. Even if Kirk Cousins goes down uh, this year or next year, um, probably not going to be the rushing upside guy. That's not what he's going to be after the injuries. Um, bad rushing totals uh, at, at uh, Washington this last year. So the only other guy to talk about after that, like from a dynasty perspective, you're looking at maybe this higher uh, upside um passing total like a Jared Goff 4500 yards 30 touchdowns that's 3 years from now because of the guaranteed contract that uh Kirk Cousins has so be advised from a dynasty perspective I wouldn't be touching him with your roster uh probably better upside guys that I could look at other places from a dynasty perspective only um I would probably be stashing Jordan Travis either like you know the last round of my draft if that's how my my roster breaks out or if uh, he makes it through and he's sitting there, like, you know, throw him on my uh, taxi squad down the line. You have to be willing to uh, negotiate with the future, uh, you know, multiple seasons in advance. Like Aaron Rodgers is 40. How many years Aaron Rodgers has left? Uh, there is enough draft capital here that the uh, the Jets may not cut bait. There is also enough uh, draft capital here that they can just get rid of him. Um, it doesn't really matter. The main reason why to hold on to him and kind of listen to uh, you'll put your, your ear to the railroad tracks is because nimbly bimbly is it does have the ability to hit um, this 20 point a, a, a game uh, threshold because of that rushing upside. That would be the reason why to make him uh, somewhat interesting. All right. Uh, and then if you're wondering about uh, Joe Milton, I, I just don't ever see the road where he becomes a starting quarterback going to the Patriots at this point to make him uh, draftable. Uh, moving on to the running backs. Let's see. So uh, number one in this is Jonathan Brooks. I have him tiered uh, together with Trey Benson. The biggest reason why I would have Jonathan Brooks above uh, Trey Benson um, is well, Jonathan Brooks is probably a better football player. The other reason is because they're, they're a road or a year away from being the number one in their offense. Like Jonathan Brooks is probably going to be in a timeshare with Chuba Hubbard this year when he's healthy. Trey Benson will probably be worked into the rotation with uh, uh, James Conner this year. Uh, James Conner's 29. He's he's probably not going to come back. Uh, Chuba Hubbard's last year of his deal, probably not going to come back. They spent a second round capital on him. Um, I would tier them from a dynasty perspective together. From a, like a redraft perspective, Jonathan Brooks would be like way ahead of Trey Benson. Jonathan Brooks is probably a better football player um, overall, and he's the, probably the second best pass blocker in the, the class overall. That's going to just give him a much higher uh, overall uh, ceiling um, because he's going to be on the field in a way that Trey Benson is not. Trey Benson again um, limited, better football player. You know he's going to take certain plays to the house with the 43940 that Jonathan Brooks wouldn't Jonathan Brooks probably you know 44 guy maybe you know obviously he didn't test but I would put them together from a dynasty perspective cuz next year you can go hey yeah um they they're, they're going to be the RB1 in their offenses and they probably aren't going to be splitting time uh that we can foresee um the next tier of guys and this is going to get a little ugly so uh you know if if you're into this type of thing if not like I understand so uh Audric Esteme right now would be running back three um, because of the fact that uh, Javante Williams is in the last year of his deal and I don't see him coming back. There is a possibility that like we could see some Maje P. Ryan get cut or something like that. We, I mean, I could even go as far as say like I could maybe see like Javante Williams getting shipped because he's in the last year of that deal. Uh, Audric Esteme is going to be athletic, athletically limited, but you know he's one of those guys that like he could just take the full bell cow uh, pass blocking, pass receiving, you know, like four six forty guy, but like you know just just give me what's there and and uh from a this is a bad comparison but uh you look at kieran williams he's a guy that's good at football athletically limited see what he did last year when a team just goes hey i trust you and go hey uh athletically limited uh austin uh, Esteme, good at football what happens when a team trusts you and uh sam payton i mean he, javante williams is limited overall athletically also and he you know he's you know, a, a bell cow light. So that's why I would have him three overall 
uh, there. Uh, Tyrone Tracy Jr., the biggest downside to this is that fifth-round draft capital um, that that I would look at. Audra Kisteme, also fifth-round draft capital, but um, Tyrone Tracy, they have Jevin Tracy or Devin Singletary there. Um, it. He, they're paying him $5 million a year. I think he's guaranteed next year also. I could see Tyrone Tracy uh, taking that job this year, if not like next year. $5 million a year to pay for a backup running back is not too pricey. Um, Tyrone Tracy is, Jr. is going to be the converted wide receiver. He's 24. Good athletic measurables. That's why I would have him here. But the, the, the possibility that he never actually outright wins the job versus Audrey Kisteme that um, next year, I don't see how they're going to pay Javante Williams. That's that's probably the difference between the two of the guys in this tier. And then the the final a guy in this tier is uh, Kamani Vidal from Troy. I don't like the six round draft capital, but in order for him to actually win the job this year, he has to uh, be able to beat out J.K. Dobbins coming off the uh, Achilles and the ACL two years ago, and uh, he's got Gus Bus with a four million dollar a year contract. So yeah, uh, can a six round draft pick do that this year? Maybe. Will he be able to do that next year? Well, he's good at football, so probably I could see that happening. Um, that's why I would have him as my running back five. After this, in the next year, uh, running back six overall is uh, Blake Corum. And this is more like, yeah, he could be a bell cow if he gets the backfield. He's going to be probably at best um, in a timeshare with uh, uh, Kyron Williams. That That's the way I would look at it. So from a dynasty perspective, you're looking at Kyron Williams not getting re-signed in two years and then him having the backfield to himself. Otherwise, it's a split. If I'm a Kyron Williams owner, he's probably more of a priority. Um, in redraft, if if I am going to uh, target Kyron Williams, and I would probably see, say that Kyron Williams is a third-round draft pick at this point in redraft, I would be uh, uh, priority handcuffing uh, Blake Corum. We'll have to see where the ADP shakes out if, if it's worth uh, trying to pick him up in a draft relative to some of the other guys that have more league winning upside. I, like I talked about with some of these, some of these situations, like the Kyron Williams, I probably would just take him off my board. It's not worth to me to try and figure it out versus the capital that I would put into him. But you do you. Oh, uh, let's see. Next guy that I have in this tier is uh, Jalen Wright. No, excuse me. Wrong one. Marshawn Lloyd that I would have. So uh, they paid Justin or uh, Josh Jacobs. Uh, Twelve million dollars a year for the next three years. They have a, a, well, a out after the twenty twenty four season um, to basically pay him twenty four million dollars to play one year if that's the way they want to go with it. Marshawn Lloyd, better athlete probably than he is a football player. Again, uh, Josh Jacobs is one of those guys, the three down guys that can block, catch, and run the football. Maybe a little bit athletically limited. Uh, Josh Jacobs is that would be the the two things that I would say. Um, that hurt Josh Jacobs would be if he has uh, taken a lot of wear and tear um, with his time with the Raiders and he was already athletically gifted or limited enough that he has to be a, a, a much better football player than Marshawn Lloyd is an athlete. Marshawn Lloyd is an athlete. That would be the one thing if, if Marshawn Lloyd can't uh, get the trust to cut into Josh Jacobs role and Josh Jacobs can just hold him off because, you know, he's that Frank Gore type of, uh, Wiley veteran. That would be what I would be looking at down the line. So maybe you could tell the story with Marshawn Lloyd where he's the RB one next year. Maybe it's the year after that. Maybe it's the year after that. That's why I would put him where I would here. Um, and again, trying to figure out if he's going to get like 20% of the work or if he's going to get like 40% of the work uh, because of maybe some of the limitations that Marshawn Lloyd has uh, as a football player. Again, uh, design passing work. Maybe he's got that. Uh, pass blocking. I don't know if he has that. And he also doesn't necessarily finish, uh, you know, being five, nine to 20, like, you know, some of these, these bigger backs, like you would just think that they're hammers and they don't necessarily play like that. So like, there is some stuff that I would be worried more about Marshawn Lloyd that in a way that like, at least with Blake, Blake Corum, I could see in like three years, he's going to have the backfield uh, in three years, Marshawn Lloyd he still might be behind Josh Jacobs because of the contract. Uh, Jalen Wright's next in this case. So uh, I don't think he's got any value in redraft at this point because um, he's probably going to be behind uh, Mostert and Jeff Wilson um, on the depth chart. And then obviously they're going to have Devin A. Chain. So uh, Mostert is theoretically under contract in two years. Um, Jeff Wilson may not even be on the roster this year. 
I could see there's a scenario in, next year because most are going to be like 35 years old. I, I, I'm joking. He's going to be like uh, 32 or 33. Uh, I could see a scenario where Jalen Wright is the 1B or 1A with Devin Aching. I think Devin Aching is a much better football player than Jalen Wright is. Uh, we could actually argue if, if Jalen Wright is a better athlete than Devin Aching, and that's that's a little ridiculous considering uh, what Devin A-Chain is. I think Devin A-Chain is special in a way that Jalen Wright is not, but at least we could see that uh, similar time split that uh, A-Chain had with Mostert uh, in two years um, You know, with uh, Jalen Wright. Hopefully you hear that, that uh, trash, trash truck outside. Next one that I have in this is Ray Davis. Um, this is the thumper to go along with James Cook. I, I could definitely see that he's going to have – he's going to be flirting with like running back two uh, this year if, if he's used in that capacity. I think the Buffalo Bills showed last year that they might really make James Cook a bell cow. Uh, the value of Ray Davis would be um, in two years if they don't re-sign James Cook. Uh, and again, with that uh, uh, the uh, franchise tag, maybe, maybe not – but that would be where his value really would be that like he could be a three down player, uh, five, eight, two, two, eleven, uh, with some good athleticism. He could be the, the bell cow in uh, three years in uh, Buffalo. That's why I would have him rank where he is. I think he's better as part of a, a, a running back by committee, but we could tell the story while he, where he gets the backfield to himself. Uh, and then Braylon Allen is the next guy that I would have on this list. Priority handcuff either in redraft and in dynasty for Braylon Allen. He's the fourth round draft pick for the Jets. Uh, probably right now would project to be the number two behind Brees Hall. Um, and then why I would put him here, and this is all the way down at like running back 10, would be, yeah, maybe we could see that the, the Jets don't resign running backs. That's what, what's been going on. And then in three years, you could see that Braylon Allen has that backfield. Like that, that would be the road to why he has value. And again, he's going to also have value. In uh, Dynasty, if I'm the uh, Brees Hall owner, I'm going to pay for, for Braylon Allen. If I'm uh, in redraft, I will also probably be uh, paying for Braylon Allen because I'm looking at probably like a top three pick for uh, Brees Hall. All right, running back 11. So I was listening to a few guys on Rashid Ali. He's probably better than his fifth round grade. And again, uh, Derek Henry over the AJ pick, uh, Keaton Mitchell, probably never going to be a bell cow. So three years down the line, you're looking at maybe the bell cow for the, uh, Baltimore Ravens. That's what I would be thinking. Why I would have them all the way down at running back 11. So there's theoretically a running back one range of outcomes for, uh, Rasheen Ali. I did watch a little bit of them like, okay, you know, um, and again, as I get older, I realize that like my evaluations of players is less valuable than my ability to predict their road to opportunity. And then uh, let's see running back 12 right now, Dylan uh, Labe or Lob or whatever you want to say, a six round draft pick out of the Raiders. Again, I don't like the draft capital, but I, I can tell the story where he uh, takes the receiving job away from uh amir abdullah this year or next year and then that's going to definitely cap zamir white's ability to have either a legendary season or a running back one season uh potentially down the line um and then the other thing with dylan labe is uh definitely next year may flirt with being that uh rb2 um and, and the receiving back for the raiders uh but we can also talk about in three years if they do not like zamir white and zamir white walks then Dylan Lave would, as a receiving back, have a lot of value as the 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 guy to own in the backfield. So now, then, if he just inherits some of the rushing work on top of being the receiving back, yeah, you have a, you have a, a an RB one in fantasy, um, a relatively cheap draft draft capital, and you're probably going to know really early if it's if if you're going to get out from underneath them. Six round draft capital, like if they don't like him, he's just not even going to make the team. Um, running back, what's this? 13 at this point uh will shipley fourth round grade means he's probably going to make the roster um probably going to be in a some type of timeshare or running back by committee with kenny gainwell and saquon barkley saquon barkley you're, we're going to be expecting with the contract to be getting like 60 70 80 percent of the work the eagles tend to use a lot of uh weapons in the backfield uh probably would move up to being the complimentary back uh next year uh kenny gainwell's in the last year of his deal um, if they don't resign uh, Kenny Gainwell, and then you're looking at Barkley at you know the usage that he's had on his body, uh, three-year deal for Barkley, 
there's a possibility that he's the the lone guy in the backfield in uh three years down the line. So maybe um I do like what Will Shipley does well. And then uh the next guy I have on this is Bucky Irving. If I could pull him up. Where he goes. Uh, fourth round draft pick by the Buccaneers. And again, this is a guy that I could th- see um, taking Chase Edmonds' uh, complimentary role to Rashad White this year. And then uh, Chase Edmonds is gone. He's the RB2 for the Buccaneers next year. And then if they don't resign uh, Rashad White, you have a role for a guy who's probably a better football player than uh, a measurables guy being on the Buccaneers in three years. So there is a road there for at least the potential for uh, running back one usage. Uh, with the Buccaneers, then Isaac Garriendo, and this is one of those things where it's like I, I like some of the what he does on the field. Um, I like the measurables, uh, six foot, like two twenty, uh, four three nine forty. I think is what he ran four three three, something like that. So big, fast guy. The problem with Isaac Garriendo is trying to parse out the backfield. So one of the things that we could look at is uh. Uh, Elijah Mitchell is in the last year of his deal that would event, essentially move Isaac Garriendo up a spot. So he's a fourth round pick, probably make the roster. They are still going to have uh, Jordan Mason on, on the team at that point. So even two years from now, you're looking at Isaac Garriendo fighting to be the RB2. And then the bigger issue is how many more years uh, Christian McCaffrey has in the league, uh, even at this uh, elite level that he has. Um, and I could definitely see that the 49ers may slowly but surely chip away at some of the less efficient work. And then Father Time's going to also chip away at that. So maybe you're looking at the possibility in three years that Isaac Goriendo is the starting running back for the 49ers. And that's that's a that's a long road uh, without the ability to go like, yeah, he's going to have a defined role. And the 49ers are going to let, uh, let everybody see what they have with him. Um, this is like an if-then-maybe and it's primarily based off the draft capital being a fourth round draft capital. And then the athletic profile, that's, that's a hard road to get there. And that would be the last guy that I would have as draftable right now is as running back 15. All right, moving on to wide receivers. So um, this is a little, a little weird. So obviously I'm going to have Marvin Harrison um, as wide receiver one overall. Uh, I think that maybe he may not be uh, an elite wide receiver and from a fantasy perspective. The reason why I would say that is he may not be the number one in his offense this year. I could also see that there's a way that he's not even the number two uh, with Michael Wilson. That's a hard road to begin with just because he's a a rookie and we think he's a generational talent. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to shake out that way uh, from uh, a, a real world perspective. And uh, his overall ceiling may be capped even as the wide receiver one because of uh, Trey McBride and Michael Wilson. I, I could see that happening. I, I don't necessarily think that's the most likely uh, scenario, but it's something to talk about. And then down the line, trying to figure out with Marvin Harrison and Trey McBride, if those two are not going to cannibalize each other, that's why I would probably put him in uh, the sub elite category. Uh, even though like if he was going to maybe a better situation, I would say that he's going to be in the elite category. I like him as a prospect. I don't necessarily think it's the best fantasy landing spot. Uh, the next guy I would have, and these guys are going to be relatively close uh, together. Um, not that I think that Lad McConkey is, you know, in the same talent tier as uh, Marvin Harrison. I just think the landing spot for Lad McConkey is better. Second round draft pick for the Chargers, potentially being the number one uh, attached to uh, Justin Herbert limited competition for opportunity uh, with uh, Quentin Johnson that may be like limited and Josh Palmer. So there's, there's a way that I could see that like Lad McConkey finishes the season as top 10, top five wide receiver this year. I could definitely see that Marvin Harrison is going to do that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that like the range of outcomes in the short term for Lad McConkey and uh, Marvin Harrison may be closer together. And then down the line, how we can separate Marvin Harrison from Trey McBride is different than trying to separate Lad McConkey from Quentin Johnson or Josh Palmer, if that makes any sense. So I I almost would want to put my value more into Lad Lad McConkey 
And, and the same thing in the NFL draft, like Lad McConkey went second overall to, to the Chargers. Uh, Marvin Harrison went four, fourth overall. A lot of teams knew that they could go draft. Uh, that's what the Chargers did. The, they went and drafted an offensive tackle in the first round of the draft, knowing that the same quality of wide uh, tackle was not going to be there in the second round, and they could go get a, rel- a really good wide receiver in the second round. That's what the Chargers did. That's what I would be saying from a dynasty perspective, how I would be viewing this. Let's see. Uh, next up, I have uh, Malik Neighbors, and this is this is tough. Uh, I am ranking him this high because of the draft capital, and I do like his ability. This is not a guy I would be interested in in redraft unless his ADP is really dep- depressed. In Dynasty, it's also a guy I'm not interested in. You're looking at uh, the number one potentially attached to Daniel Jones and the guy to take coverage off of him may be Darren Waller. If Darren Waller comes back, if Darren Waller doesn't come back, you're looking at Jalen Hyatt potentially being the guy to take coverage away from Malik neighbors and teams being scared of Devin Singletary in the, in the running game. That is a very hard road to say he's not going to end up being Terry McLaurin. That's how I would view it. I would still put him at wide receiver three because like, I would be scared to say like, I, I really should move him into like wide receiver seven, something like that. Uh, that tier probably, yeah, probably about like wide receiver seven, but I, I don't have the guts to do that based off the draft capital and talent. Uh, let's see wide receiver four. It's going to be Xavier Leggett. So again, the measurables and the draft capital, uh, first pick 32nd, uh, overall going to the Panthers, Instant pathway to be the number one attached to Bryce Young. That could happen. Deontay Johnson is probably number more of a number two. Adam Thielen more of a number three. Not really worried about uh, Sanders, the, the rookie tight end. So we have the ability for uh, Xavier Leggett, 6'1", 221, sub 4'4", 4, 4'3", We have the ability. He, uh, you're not going to say he's Debo. I think that's the, the wrong comp. But there are elements of his game that we could say, like, yes, he's got some yak to him. And, uh, you know, he, he's probably uh, not the, the the polished receiver that Debo was even coming out of college, but there is a road for him to be the number one in his offense. And it's right now. That's why I would have him there as my wide receiver four, wide receiver five. Um, and, and if you've been following the channel a little bit, I really like uh, Javon Baker, really good landing spot. Like he has the pathway right now to finish as a wide receiver one attached to Drake May with the New England offense. And I have this picked up. Like I do like uh, what they did with uh, Polk, Wallace, and uh, Robinson and uh, Javon Baker. Like that, so it, it goes from this is a really bad landing spot to we can tell the story where it's a okay landing spot to go to, and then uh, tell the story where Javon Baker becomes the number one. And I'll and I'll get into that here in a second because I got the the second round draft pick that we're going to talk about with the the Patriots in this same tier. I would like Javon Baker better probably because it's going to cost me less um, draft capital to go get him than it's going to ta- cost to go get Polk. And I think Javon uh, Baker has a higher range of outcomes to be special. I don't necessarily think Polk has that uh, range of outcomes. So that would just be me. Uh, let's see. Uh, Brian Thomas Jr. would be my uh, wide receiver six. Um, 23 overall to the Jaguars. So I like the draft capital. I like the athletic profile. I, I like some of what he does on the field. You know, he, he, there is still a little bit more he's going to have to develop. May not jump in and be the number one for Trevor Lawrence right away. May take a little bit of time. Remember, it's going to be a su- somewhat crowded wide receiver room with uh, the re- uh, the signing of uh, Gabe Davis. They're going to have Evan Ingram probably right now to be the number one in the offense. Uh, 143 targets I think he had last year as a tight end. Uh, Christian Kirk to be the vertical slot. They still have uh, Zay Jones on that deal that they they signed him with. Uh, I, I imagine Zay Jones might get cut to make room for Brian Thomas Jr. Parker Washington I did like. So th- there is a lot of mouths to feed, and that's on top of uh, Travis Etienne in that backfield. Uh, for him to jump up and really be in that uh, elite type of tier of wide receiver. And again, like you're looking at uh, 23, like well, like 20 to, to 20. Uh, 20, 20, 20 to 25 points to really move the needle outside of that. Like then you're starting to get into like high end uh, running back or the, the line, the blurry line between high end wide receiver two and low end wide receiver one that I would be looking at overall. So 
that's why I would probably put him down here. Like maybe in five years, he could be in that elite tier. Um, we can start telling that story right now. It's, it's a harder road that he may, uh, have the best of uh, the highest range of outcomes to be a wide receiver two right now, um, next year. And then it becomes a little bit harder down the line to, to, uh, predict the future. Let's see. Now we're going to talk about, uh, Jalen Polk, the second round draft pick by the, the, the Patriots. Again, this is somewhat having to do more with the draft capital. I think he's a fine player. I think he would work best as a wide receiver too, um, in most offenses, which is going to have a lot of capital. The main reason why I would have him in this tier with Leggett, Baker, uh, BTJ, uh, and Polk himself is because uh, anybody who has the ability to be the, the number one in offense is going to be fantasy relevant with the draft capital. They they obviously like Polk more than they like uh, Baker. They went up and they they pulled the trigger on him. Um, I could definitely see that he finishes the number one in the offense. It doesn't mean with Baker and Polk that they will ever be uh, like the elite tier guys. Uh, I think, like I said, I think Baker is special in a way that I don't think Polk is necessarily special. I think Polk is good, um, but I could definitely see them finishing. Uh, I could see Polk finishing as the number one or Baker finishing number, the number one in the offense and being like, uh, wide receiver twos, even early on in their careers, not necessarily huge uh, needle movers. And then this is going to be the next tier of guys. This would be, uh, well, in, in some way, shape, or form, like the, the, the fourth fourth or fifth tier of guys. Uh, first guy I'm going to talk about is Rome Adunze. Uh, went nine overall to the Bears. This is not a problem of talent. This is a problem of saying, hey, when can he be uh, elite and special? Because I think he is elite and special. But how are we going to tell the story where uh, he gets the uh, C.D. Lamb you know, 135 targets, 1,700 yards receiving and 12 touchdowns when he's attached to a, an offense where we have a rookie quarterback, DJ Moore, uh, old man Keenan Allen, the technician, and Cole Komet. That's what I'm talking about. So I could definitely see a situation where he finishes as a rookie uh, along the Jordan Addison stat line of 70 receptions for uh, 911 yards and 10 touchdowns. And you're basically getting a low end wide receiver two, high end wide receiver three. That's why I would have him down there. And and with Keenan Allen and DJ Moore there, um, I could definitely see that this before we can see Rome moving up into like a higher tier wide receiver where he's you know uh, a Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddle type guy, T. Higgins, um, you know, flirting with wide receiver one. It may take until Keenan Allen leaves in like two, three years down the line. And then at that point, like there still may be a DJ Moore uh going on with or still DJ Moore still maybe with the Bears and under the 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 AJ Pex. Like that's that's the the really hard road to get there when we talk about uh how we could get Rome theoretically into that uh wide receiver one or elite tier. That's why I would have him all the way down here. Like you know I would rather him be be uh, uh someone else's problem than for me to go up and snag him earlier on in the draft and try and tell the story about how he can get me uh, able to compete with uh, C.D. Lamb next year. All right, uh, wide receiver nine overall is uh, A.D. Mitchell. Let's see if I can pull him up. So he tumbled in the draft. There's some controversy about that. I don't care about anything of that. Athletic profile, yes. Some things to like on tape. That's awesome. Um, don't necessarily know if he's going to uh, win the job as the X. The number two, uh, Alec Pierce is still there. I can definitely see he will inherit it. Alec Pierce has not necessarily been anything more than what he was drafted to be as that number two in that offense. Um, and then the other thing with uh, A.D. Mitchell is he's going to be behind Michael Pittman. So in order for him to take that jump, he has to flop Michael Pittman. Now we've seen this before with like a Justin Jefferson. It can happen. It's just how many years down the line are we going to be able to, or how many years down the line are we going to be able to speculate before that, that, that flop happens? Even if I'm a big, uh, AD Mitchell guy. And I think guys like AD Mitchell, uh, and BTJ, like they, they have a little bit longer roads to be elite level, uh, fantasy wide receivers. And then the say the last guy in this tier is, uh, Roman Wilson, believe this or not, third round draft pick by the Steelers slots right in to be the Z next to George Pickens. The, the big issue uh, with Roman Wilson is not necessarily an, an issue. Uh, I would tear him here because I could definitely see him being the more possession vertical slot guy in this offense and being on the field. Like he is a run blocker at 511, 185. 
So I get, he will probably be the starter. It just becomes an issue. Is if he going to be the number three option behind Muth, or is he going to be the actual number one in the offense? I can see that range of outcomes right away where he is the uh, more possession type guy, the vertical possession guy. And George Pickens is the side guy, the guy that George Pickens is. So if George Pickens doesn't move out of the boom bust wide receiver two slash like wide receiver three range. And Roman Wilson is more of the consistent week to week guy in the offense. I can see that happening. That's why I would uh, rank him as wide receiver 10 uh, wide receiver 11 Jer uh, Jermaine Burton from Alabama. I really like Jermaine Burton on tape. I guess there are personality issues with him. Um, down the line, trying to project him to be the number two in this offense with the T Higgins situation, third round draft capital. There is a lot there to like, and that's why I would put him as 11 because I can tell the story where in two years, he's the number two in this offense overall. So that's why I would put him as 11. Um, jumping up to uh, Xavier Worthy. So uh, right now in the short term, especially after the uh, Kelsey contract extension, you're looking at maybe the wide receiver three, the number four option in the offense. And then uh, Hollywood Brown is on that one-year rental. And then Xavier Worthy can move up into that role with Rasheed Rice and Travis Kelsey. It be, just becomes an issue like, yeah, I can see a one-to-one -one comparison to Tyreek Hill. But Tyreek Hill wasn't Tyreek Hill until the end of his rookie year. And then it took a couple more years before him to develop into the, the possession guy. That's if Xavier Worthy is a one-to-one -one, uh, comparison to Tyreek Hill. And uh, I don't necessarily think that that's... Uh, a bad comparison. I also don't think that's necessarily an apples to apples comparison between two. I do like him. I do like him in the offense. Probably better to say that he's going to be in that wide receiver two range down the line than a, a true nine wide receiver one. But it, there's enough there that I would probably put him as a 12 overall and then a, a little bit murky on when he's going to get the opportunity to really break out down the line. That's why I would put him all the way down here. That's also why I would put, um, let me clear this out. Ricky Pearsall in this range uh, as my wide receiver, what, uh, 13 overall. Trying to figure out when Ricky Pearsall, the number one draft pick for the 49ers, is able to actually be consistently relevant with uh, Devo and Brandon Ayuk. Now, uh, if Brandon Ayuk gets shipped, I would move Ricky uh, Pearsall up. Um, and then they're also going to have George, Pe uh, George Kittle there. George Kittle's 30. If uh, Brandon Ayuk gets shipped, yeah, I would move Ricky Pearsall up. If uh, Devo gets cut down the line, you know, we can start telling the story where Ricky Pearsall is the number two in the offense or potentially like consistently the number the number three if when with uh, George Kittle there. That's going to be the problem is to get Ricky Pearsall up to wide receiver two may take three or four years. I, I do think he has the talent and he is going to be attached to Brock Purdy. It's going to be a long road from a dynasty perspective. And, you know, if I can't wait the four years for Ricky Pearsall to have his breakout, then then I would rank him all the way down here as my wide receiver 13. All right. Um, let's see. Keon Coleman next uh, going to be wide receiver. I think I screwed up. Or wide receiver 14 overall. Probably going to be capped out as uh, an X and the number two in the Buffalo offense. Uh, I, I think the skill set between Keon Coleman and Khalil Shakur is different. So I could just definitely see him basically being a one to run replacement for Gabe Davis. And we all know what we have with Gabe Davis. So like wide receiver three, maybe has a little bit more uh, shake and wiggle to his game, um, you know, to, to be a yak guy, uh, which would move him up to like maybe a, a good solid wide receiver two. But that's why I would have him all the way down there in the offense. The other thing with Keon Coleman is if uh, Dalton Kincaid is a unicorn, he's never going to be the number one in the offense. And then next up I have, and this is wide receiver 15, Luke McCaffrey, third round draft pick for the Redskins. Um, may be a little deceptive on what his range of outcomes is. Does slot in to be like a big slot only guy. I could definitely see him being maybe a little bit more Cooper Cup S down the line. Um, and then we also have the possibility that like scary, scary carry is already a little old from a, a, a you know a real world perspective. So there is a road where Luke McCaffrey becomes the number one in that offense down the line attached to uh, Jane Daniels. So yeah, there is a little bit more value to Luke McCaffrey down the line, similar to Ricky Pearsall, but he may have more short-term value as being the number two in the offense right now this year. 
even if it's in a limited role. And then Malachi Corley, wide receiver 16, the uh, third third round pick by the Jets. Um, manufactured touch yak guy coming out of college. Uh, that's going to be the issue. I don't know how many years it's going to take for him to break out. There may be some limited uh, route running um, problems with Malachi Corley. We also don't know what when uh, Aaron Rodgers is going to hang it up and who the next quarterback is going to be there. There's a lot to go, hey, I don't like this. I like the draft capital, obviously. Um, may end up being the number two wide receiver if Mike uh, uh, Mike Williams isn't healthy. That could happen. That that should be factored in a little bit. But uh, short of just being, and I, and I, I heard the comp the other day, short of just being like Randall Cobb, to Aaron Rodgers, like I don't, I don't know when he's going to have that long-term upside value. Uh, I talked about this before. Like I think Malachi Corey's biggest fantasy impact is taking away opportunities from uh, uh, Garrett Wilson, Brees Hall, and and Mike Williams. That's probably what it's, <laughs> that's probably what it's going to be long-term. But I can definitely see how he could maybe end up as a wide receiver two down the line based off of draft capital. And then uh, next tier group, we're going to be looking at if I could. Jalen McMillan, uh, third round draft pick, going to the Buccaneers. So Mike Evans is old. Chris Godwin is old. They have uh, Trey Palmer there. So I could definitely see him either eventually being the number one, number one, number two, number three in the offense. That's why I would have him tiered uh, draft capital. I do like him? You know, I don't think he's ever going to be a number one. Um, you're you're flirting at like maybe low end wide receiver two range of outcomes for him. Uh, high end wide receiver three. Let's see Washington Franklin Troy Franklin uh fourth round draft capital from Oregon going to uh the Broncos so again uh don't love the draft capital it is a fourth round pick he's going to make the team down the line uh could theoretically end up being the number one in this offense I don't think he's going to ever be a, a number one overall from a fantasy perspective could see him capping out as a wide receiver too uh trying to get through all the wide receivers that are there uh, Bo Nix is good and you know, he, he earns playing time. It's going to be a longer road to parse out with Troy Franklin. And that part of that's going to be off of the draft capital fourth round pick doesn't not mean that they can get out from underneath it rather easily. And then to finish all this off, this is a different tier. Uh, Tez Walker, a fourth round pick going to uh, Baltimore Ravens. I could definitely see him turning into like that X to go along with uh, Zay flowers uh, in that offense. So, may have wide receiver two range of outcomes probably uh, down the line not this year going to be wide receiver uh you know uh wide receiver three uh you know wide receiver two that type of range attached to this offense never probably going to be like that league winning tier but still going to have value um and then down the line like i probably would be drafting johnny wilson in all leagues if for no other uh reason that he is probably going to slot in to be that big x for the philadelphia eagles Probably going to have wide receiver three maybe right now um, if he can win that job. Uh, and then the targets where they're trying to take away Devonta Smith and A.J. Brown would go to him. So, again, like you you may have a, a plug-in wide receiver three this year. Don't love the draft capital, but, like, you know, if, if you're spending, like, that fourth-round pick in uh, Dynasty, yeah, you know, I could see – um. I, I could definitely see him returning on investment. You could get out from underneath it. And this may be the guy that they, when they brought in, um, what's his face? Anyway, uh, I could definitely see him being the uh, touchdown guy in the red zone. That's going to bother me. The uh, Huh. Anyway, oh Julio Jones. God, what, what am I thinking? Uh well, they brought in Julio Jones to kind of be that guy in the red zone. I could definitely see Johnny Wilson taking over that spot. All right. Uh, and then there's a couple other guys that I would talk about, probably not draftable, but Brendan uh Brendan Rice from USC and uh Cor Cornelius Johnson from Michigan, uh two big body guys going to Jim Par uh, Harbaugh's offense. So remember that they may have gone out and got Lad McConkey. Um, and these guys, seventh round draft pick, they could get out from underneath these guys. I kind of like both of them in that developmental type of range. The bigger issue is you're going to have, uh, or the bigger thing to like, you're you're going to have Justin Herbert as the starting quarterback. 
and then uh Josh Palmer and Quentin Johnson down the line. So there is a possibility that like Josh Palmer is not going to be there forever. Uh, probably is an okay wide receiver too. That's probably his range of outcomes. I don't know if the Chargers are going to necessarily want to pay him. Uh, Quentin Johnson could be a bust. So yeah, you're looking at at, at wide receiver two that is you're going to be able to uh, you know throw out the bottom of your bench, your taxi squad, and see how things break out in the uh, during training camp with these two guys for relatively nothing. It's just something to be paying attention to based off the landing spot. All right, let's move on to tight ends and get this done for the day. Uh, let's see. Uh, obviously Brock Bowers, he's going to be my tight end one. Again, this is mostly going to be, uh, based off of, uh, talent. Um, Michael Mayer's already going to be there. I was thinking about this the other day. Why I think teams are starting to go to these two tight end comps is because you can sign Brock Bowers and Michael Mayer for probably less money as top end or elite or sub elite tight ends for less money than it would cost to, to sign a, a wide receiver one, like a, uh, you know, Sun God or Tyreek Hill. That's why I think they're going to do it. Uh, I think Kittle was getting like 17 million. Uh, you know, Kelsey's going to get like 17 and a half. So you can see down the line that Brock Bowers might command that 17, 18 million dollars a year. Michael Mayer as that like why only guy might get in that that the ballpark of like you know 12 to 15 million dollars. You get two guys for the price of one. That's why I think teams are going to go that. And they these tight ends can really mess with defenses in a way that a wide receiver can't because you could go, Oh, you want to go, you want to go small. We're going to run the football down your throat. You want to go big. We're going to make you your, your, your linebacker have to go cover block Brock Bowers. That's why I would think it's there. I, I definitely think Brock Bowers this year um, may have a, a, a lower ceiling than your Brent Sano, uh coming out of uh, Kansas, uh, Kansas state going to the Redskins because he projects right now to step in and be the uh, tight end, the starting tight end for the Redskins based off draft capital. So again, I, I, I think these guys are much closer together earlier on in their career uh, than, than maybe we would like them to be. Um, and, and I would almost tier them the same. If, if I really want to be cute in my dynasty draft, my rookie draft, I would probably be going for Sinote over Bowers. And again, I don't really care. I like Sinote. I think there are favorable comparisons to Sam Laporta. Uh, so I, I don't think that's necessarily unfair. Uh, and but I think most people are going to overvalue Bo Brock Bowers. And best case scenario, Brock Bowers, he's going to be the number two behind Devontae Adams this year. The bigger problem with is uh, as much as I love Gardner Minshew as a, as a uh, personality, and I root for him, and he's the mascot of the channel. Um, your best case scenario is Brock or as uh, Gardner Minshew is the quarterback this year, and uh, Gardner Minshew is the we're projecting him to be the quarterback next year. I would probably like a better talent attached to Brock Bowers in the future. And there's no guarantee he's going to be anything more than like Dalton Kincaid last year, this year, and down the line, he's going to be Dalton Kincaid. Uh, it's, it's a harder road to figure out how relevant Brock Bowers is going to be betting on quote unquote, his talent than the opportunity that Benson Oat has to potentially be the number two attached to Jalen Daniels right now. All right. Uh, and then the next tier, the only other guy I have is uh, Jatavion Sanders, the fourth round pick attached to uh, Bryce Daniels and the Panthers. Um, again, this is draft capital. He's a you know, good enough draft capital fourth round uh, to step in and be the starter right away. I think this is an entirely different or multiple uh, tier groups down with uh, Jatavion Sanders. But again, I, I can tell the story how he goes in there. There's either going to be the opportunity for the number two if uh, leg gets a bust and uh, Deontay Johnson is the number one. Um, so you could easily get to him being the number two, probably more than likely he may be the number four behind uh, Adam Thielen, but at least we could tell the story. And then down the line, uh, definitely could see that he could eat into that number two role. Best case scenario, and um, Bryce Young turns the corner. That's why I would have him as my wide receiver three coming out of this draft. And then it gets really weird because I did listen to some guys talk about Eric All. There is some stuff to like about him. Fourth round draft pick. Uh, potentially being the uh, attached to Joe Burrow as early as next year. That could happen. Um, McLaughlin also, also la landed there. They may end up in those two tight end sets. Um, so I don't know how much I would really want to be spending on either one of these guys uh, down the line. But, uh, you know, fourth round draft capital going to an offense run by Joe, Joe Burrow probably would keep all four. And uh, 
that just being uh, Tanner McLaughlin five because of the potential landing spot and that vacated uh, that void. Again, this is going to go back to how much you like uh, Jermaine Burton potentially being the number two in the offense because that means that the number three is potentially going to be one of these two tight ends and that's with t higgins leaving so that's a long story behind it like again i don't particularly like any of the uh the tight ends beyond Sinote um coming out of the draft outside of that dart throw range um a couple more interesting guys to talk about like wiley actually uh, the main reason why i came out to do this video today wiley got moved down i probably would have had wiley as my tight end three if it wasn't for uh the travis kelsey news the extension so right now fourth round draft capital there's a story with noah gray being in the last year of his deal where uh jared wiley could have been uh the starting tight end for the kansas city chief as, as early as next year with the uh Ta travis kelsey extension now it's a much longer road for him to be the tight end attached to travis uh or patrick mahomes but i would still have him as my tight end six coming out of this draft uh let's see Johnson. Theo Johnson would be my tight end seven attached to this draft. Uh, again, Darren Waller has to go. Daniel Bellinger has to be like the why maybe, maybe Theo Johnson's the why. Again, my big problem isn't the fourth round grade. It's not the athletic measurables. It's going to be uh, Daniel Jones as the quarterback. So there is a road by year three breakout tight end that Theo Johnson is uh if not, probably the number two in the offense. Uh, if we're if we're betting on Malik Neighbors, we just don't know who the quarterback's going to be. Uh, tight end eight is going to be Jaheim Bell uh, with the Patriots again. Um, like some of the athletic pr profile of Jaheim Bell being like that H position, maybe for the Patriots uh, attached to Drake May. So there is something there. I, I probably would be stashing him. Um, but again, right now the the Patriots have Hunter Henry resigned and they brought in Austin Hooper. It is a longer road to tell with Jaheim Bell, and the draft capital says that the, the Patriots can get out from underneath him. So again, probably wouldn't be drafting him. And then uh, the other guy, if if you're being sneaky and you have those deeper those deeper benches, uh, is Devin Culp, uh, the 447 tight end that went seventh round to the Buccaneers. Again, I like Kate Otten. I think they'll resign Kate Otten. We could tell the story down the line that they're running two tight ends with the Buccaneers. Don't know who the quarterback's going to be. Don't know much of anything else. You're betting on the athletics, athleticism. That's one of the things with the tight end position. What we can kind of uh, predict in the future is that those high athlete, high athletic tight ends, year three, second year tie, uh, contract, those type of things. So again, way down the line, probably not draftable. I'm not going to be sitting him uh, trying to check this out. And then I don't even know how to uh, really evaluate this situation with Tip Reman and and. Yo, know, a 6'5, 271 that run a, a 4 5 1 or 4 6 1 40 wide tight end. Uh, what gets really, really odd about this is the draft capital, the athletic profile say this is awesome, attached to what we could say is a good or okay quarterback in Kyler Murray. All the stuff that we really love, except for the fact he projects to be the number two tight end behind Trey McBride, and at best probably the number four option in this offense behind Marvin Harrison Jr. and Michael Wilson. So like, I don't even know how to evaluate tip Riemann at all uh, to be honest with you, but I have to put him up here because yeah, I could definitely see that like he's going to be, you know, theoretically uh, able to flirt with a top 10 tight end in three years. Uh, that's just how I have to, I have to break it down. I just, I would probably put him, I think I have him at, tight end 10 just because of how obscene the situation is probably not draftable um overall but yeah that's how i would put them so i i think that's about everybody that i got hopefully this is going to be a rookie breakdown for dynasty and uh somewhat redraft and uh you know i'll, I'll go back to uh trying to reevaluate my rankings and start talking about the movers and the shakers and that this week